Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all here today, and welcome to Golf Church. We're so excited for church today, and I hope you are too. Uh, and happy Thanksgiving season. We're getting close. A anybody planning to head out of town for Thanksgiving this year? Okay, we've got like half the room. Um, I've been wondering how many people are going to leave us, because we're staying here for Thanksgiving. Wondering how many people are going to leave town. Um, but uh, anyway, if you are part of Gulf Church regularly and this is your church home, I want to say welcome once again. Thank you for being part of this church community. I love being in this, in this community with you. And if you're new today, thank you so much for joining us, for checking us out. I know that can be a little nerve-wracking sometime, but uh, we're so glad that you checked us out today. This is a great place for you to be, and you really picked a great day to be here. Um, it's a great place for me to be. I love coming here every week. The community is so welcoming and warm, and I think the messages, I think you'll agree, are just so practical and, and helpful to our daily lives. So I think it's going to be a, a really good, really good experience for you. If you are new, uh, just so you know how it works here, we'll spend about an hour together. In just a bit, we'll stand up and greet one another. Then we'll move into some music and have our teaching time for the day. Um, and if you are new, make sure you come say hello at some point. When, you, when you're ready, come say hello to me or my wife, Courtney, uh, or one of our church leaders. You, and you can stop by the welcome desk on the way out. We've got a, a gift for you, and uh, we'd love for you to um, uh, fill out the connection card so we can stay in touch with you. Um, but we have some great things coming up at our church, uh, especially this holiday season. And by the way, here's the schedule of the holiday upcoming stuff. And you'll note that there's a day where we won't be having in-person service, but you can mark your calendars accordingly there. Um, but we are having service the Sunday after Thanksgiving. I've been getting that question a lot. So uh, you can see the whole schedule up there. In fact, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, we're going to bribe you to be here, and we're going to give everybody popcorn that day, okay? So if you, so, in case you're, yeah, maybe I won't, maybe I'll stay home, make sure you come out for the free popcorn. <laughs> and, uh, and that would be a great day to invite a friend, by the way, because that one, December 1st, is the start of our new Christmas series with Andy Stanley. Uh, invite a friend, a family member, that would be a perfect time for them to come uh, check it out. So that said, uh, once again, thank you so much for being here. One thing we really believe in here at Gulf Church is connecting with each other. Um, you can watch, you know, great messages at home. That's not the only reason we're here. We're here to connect with each other, too. And uh, we like to make a few minutes available for that uh, connection time. So in just a minute, we'll stand up. I encourage you to find someone around you to introduce yourself to or reconnect with. Let's really engage in this time and really have a few moments of connection here. And then make sure you stay standing after that because we're going to move into our music and singing time from there. So that said, let's all stand up, turn around, find someone and say hello. All right. Well, let's stay standing because we're about to move into our music time for the day. By the way, the music will be a really, um, I think, inspiring today. And I believe it's sandwiched in the middle. We'll see a baptism, uh, which is very exciting. And uh, you can, s at that time, feel free to sit down. But it's going to be a little up and down today, which we don't normally do. But that said, um, if you don't know, we are uh, broadcast partners with North Point, which means that um, most of the time our messages, and uh, usually our music too, is coming uh, from North Point in Atlanta, and that's what will be happening again today. So uh, we're excited to be led in a time of singing some songs with the North Point Band. So let's stay standing as the North Point Band leads us. Well, amazing. This is, uh, that was an awesome time of singing. Thanks for engaging with that. You know, he does, um, if you kind of think of that analogy, he, our Heavenly Father, does leave the 99 to go after the one, the one lost, the one prodigal child. And um, in, in this series especially, and especially given our, 
message last week, it's a good reminder that he loves us that much. And a little teaser from last week, if you weren't here, is that um, maybe you feel like you're in a place where you, it's time for me to come back, come back to my father. And uh, that song is a good reminder that he's ready to welcome you back with open arms. But that's not the message for today. We've got another awesome message coming in just a minute. Um, but before then, um, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much to everybody here who has participated in our campaign called Be Rich. This is our generosity and serving campaign for our local community charitable partners. Uh, it's been an amazing campaign for a bunch of reasons. We moved into part two, the serving part, at Point Siena Elementary School uh, yesterday. Uh, we were out there uh, yesterday morning serving at Point Siena Elementary, uh, improving the grounds, uh, beautifying the grounds there. You may remember uh, a while back we did a project um, in those areas where you were seeing that picture where we uh, took a, a space that was kind of like desolate, just a bunch of uh, sand basically, and turned it into an awesome place of um, basically a beautiful garden. And then yesterday we were back there um, revitalizing it again, freshening it up, making it look awesome. Uh, the thing with Be Rich is it starts with generosity. So I want to say thank you to everyone who has given to Be Rich. And we we really did collect uh, a, a, a great number of funds for it. And I can't wait to share the exact numbers and results with you next week. But I just want to say thank you to everyone who gave because it's blowing me away to see uh, your generosity. And we're going to be able to give 100% of it away to all of our local charitable partners so we can make uh, a difference in our community. And thank you to everyone who came out to serve at Point Siena Elementary yesterday. It was a lot of fun, and we got to make a difference in the lives of students and teachers. We talk a lot about these students at Point Siena Elementary who really school is the highlight of their day every day. Um, they, and uh, there's about 93 kids there that um, live below the poverty line and just a, a beautiful garden is a great way for them to start their day and, and let them know that this is going to be a good day. And they know that it came from us. So they know that we love them. We are for them. God cares for them. And it's a great way for us to uh, connect with our community. So thank you, everyone, for being part of that. Well, that said, we are now moving into our teaching time. We're in the middle of a series called The Power of a Made-Up Story. And um, Joel Thomas at, at North Point is leading us in that series. So let me pray for us, and then we'll hear from Joel for the next part in the, in, uh, in the series. Well, Lord, thank you so much for everyone that's here. Thank you for this com church community that you're building. This is yours, and you. we just invite you to grow us um, in our hearts, in our spirit, in our lives, in our relationships. Um, do a mighty work here um, continually, and we just lift it all, lift this entire community up to you. We pray for the students at Point Siena Elementary that um, you would give them hope, uh, help, the, the strength that they need every day. And we pray that that little gesture of a nice garden would be a blessing to them and would be a blessing to the staff and the whole faculty that, that learns that it came from Gulf Church. And um, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to see more and more ways to be a blessing to every uh, one of our community partners to, to show love to the greater Naples community. And now, Lord, we turn our attention to you, and um, we're listening. As we go to the teaching time now, we invite you to just speak to each one of our hearts. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. There once was a boy who never truly felt like he belonged. He was mistreated and lived in a cupboard under the stairs until one day, a large stranger told him he was a wizard, and he explained the lightning-shaped scar he got as a baby after narrowly avoiding death. And as you can see, I am not dead, T'Challa shouted as he approached his estranged cousin, ready to reclaim the throne. Although his adversary would not yield, those loyal to him fought back valiantly, inspired by 
1.21 gigawatts of electricity racing through the flux capacitor, giving the DeLorean enough power to make it back to 1985. Marty smiled. He was headed home after what could only be described as... After what could only be described as some sort of dream, she finally realized she could find everything her heart desired in her own backyard. She clicked her heels together three times and said, If you build it, they will come, Ray. The one constant through all the years has been baseball. This field, this game, it's part of our past. It reminds us of all that was once good and it could be again. And then Ray looked up and saw the young baseball player waiting on the field was actually his father. It was actually his father, the villain who had taken his hand with a lightsaber and then tried to woo him with promises of shared dominion over the galaxy, stood before him and revealed his true identity. He stood there stunned as the music swelled to close out the shocking, powerful scene. I love it. So epic. Uh, if you weren't here with us last week, we kicked off a new series uh, about the power of story and specifically made up stories. Some of the most powerful stories um, most of us have ever encountered aren't actually even really true in, in the sense that they didn't actually happen, but they resonate deeply because things about them are true. And um, this is uh, part of what Jesus and his ministry, what he did uh, to make an impact in people's lives. He, he told all sorts of made up stories. And if you weren't here with us last week, we kicked this off as a series about parables. And we looked at a few parables last week, but um, these weren't just made up stories. I, I taught you a new uh, Hebrew word last week called Haggadah, which reminds us all of ice cream. And you're gonna have to deal with this for the next few weeks. But um, the, the Haggadah is, is basically storytelling with a point. And in the Hebrew rabbinical tradition, they would tell these stories, often made up stories. And these stories had a point and they, they forced a decision. And, and Jesus' stories, they were, they were powerful and, and they were oftentimes disturbing and disruptive, as I told you last week. And they caused us all to have to make a decision. Last week we looked at a series of three stories Jesus told about lost things, sheep, coins, and a son. And, and the, the point of the story was you celebrate when lost things are found. And, and, and the, the decision was, will you join the search party? And will you join the homecoming party when people that are lost, regardless of who they are, when, when they're found? And, um, and so if you weren't here with us last week, you're going to want to go back. It was a powerful week. Um, I hate that you weren't in the room. If you weren't in the room last week, it was a powerful experience. If you haven't watched online, uh, you'll want to check that out. Uh, I want to take a second step today. There's something else powerful when it comes to a Haggadah or, or this, these made-up stories. Uh, characterization, as in a lot of stories, characterization is so important. The best stories have really uh, pronounced and important characters, and they're of, of crucial importance uh, in these parables or these made-up stories that Jesus would tell. Um, and, and so when it comes to, to different characters, uh, there in, in the stories, that Jesus, as I told you last week, used all sorts of relatable characters. I told you the, the basic elements of his story, uh, of Jesus' parables, but characterization was something that was critical so that he could connect with his audience. He told stories about normal people, about shepherds and farmers and fathers and sons, priests and Levites and masters and servants. There, there were all things they understood in their culture and were, were commonplace and common roles. But most common in Jesus' stories, in fact, in almost all of Jesus' parables, there's at least two characters that are in every story. There's other extras, uh, other stock characters in the stories. But there's, there's two main stories. There's always a story that represented God, uh, or a character that represented God, because he, he told the story so we would understand who the Father was, we'd understand who God was, and his relationship to us. So then there was always somebody who represented man, and in particularly, you somebody who would represent you. Now, the one character in any of Jesus' story that was never a stock character was the king. If you ever see a parable or a story about a king, always in the story about kings that Jesus would tell, it was a direct characterization of God. So here's, here's the thing. You don't have to wonder who the king is today because it's not you and it's not me. Uh, we're not the king. But the goal and what I'd like for you to try to figure out in today's story is who are you? Where, where do you show up in the story? Uh, today, Matthew chapter 18, it's a made-up story about a king and two servants. 
And um, again, as, as I told you, your job is to try to figure out who you are in the story. But I have to give you one, one warning. Um, I know we don't have a chalkboard again. I know some of you will give me a hard time. I'll get some more emails about that. Um, but we do have this mysterious black table. Uh, that something will magically appear on at some point. I won't, I won't scare you with that. But I do get you to give you this warning. We're going to have to do some mathematics today. Now, some of you, you grew up, you, didn't, you weren't good at math, you didn't like math. So I'm going to help you with the math. But those of you who are good at math, you're going to have to follow along. Maybe you can help us along with this. Um, but we're going to do some math because it's important to understanding uh, this story. Uh, many of Jesus' parables uh, began with Jesus responding to a question. And in Matthew chapter 18, that's how the, this begins. Je Jesus has asked a question. And if you have a, a Bible or you're following in your device, Matthew chapter 18, we're going to begin down verse 21. And here's how it begins. It says, then Peter came to Jesus. He came to Jesus and he asked him. He said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times, which seems like a random number. We're going to come back to that in a minute. How many times? I mean, that in Hebrew, that was the number of completion. So maybe it's like, okay, that's, that's why he asked us. And Jesus said, no, not seven times, he replied, but 70 times seven. Now, lots been made of this number. Here, here's what I want, I want you to know. The first time this shows up in the scriptures is in Genesis chapter 4. It's at the end of Genesis chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel. And here's what it means. It just means an infinite amount. There's no math here. You don't have to do the math. 70 times 7 is not what it's trying to represent. It's, it's an indescribable amount is what it's trying to say. It, this, this is used metaphorically in the scriptures for sort of this infinite amount. Therefore, this is, this is Jesus telling tell the story. He's about to tell a story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. So in response to Peter's question, Jesus says, no, 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 it's not, you don't give, forgive seven times. It's 70 times seven. Let me give you an illustration of how this works. There's a king. Lots of people are off, offered him money. And, and, and here's the thing. This, is, this represents the kingdom of heaven. The economy, if you will, of heaven. This is how this works. And one of the servants um, who borrowed money from him, he was being called on his account. In the process, um, one of the debtors was brought in who owed him, and this, this is important, Morion Talenton. Morion Talenton. Now, I don't know what, what version of the scripture is using. There's de several different translations. And, and, there, and again, there's lots of reliable translations. We're looking at the New Living Translation. Your translation might have inserted here uh, 10,000 bags of gold. The, the actual, the literal translation is 10,000 talents. Now, we don't know what a talent is, so we're going to come back to that in a minute. But 10,000 talents is what this first servant owed. And he couldn't pay. He couldn't pay it. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife along with his children and everything he owed to pay the debt. And it wasn't even going to cover it. But, but that's what, he, that's what he, it, was, it was demanded that every, he, he, basically his life, his whole life be liquidated. But the man fell. He fell down before his master and he begged him, please be patient with me and I'll pay it all. So he, he's pleading with the king his master, and he's saying, look, don't sell me into slavery. Don't sell my family. Please just give me some more time. Then his master, I love this, filled with, if you were here last week, same word as the father who was standing on the front porch. His master was filled with compassion for him. This is what the king is like. This is what God is like. He was filled with compassion for him, and he released him, and he forgave his debt. He forgave the entire debt. That, that's, that he basically said, because you, you've fallen uh, on, on yourself, you've fallen down before me, and, and you're begging for mercy, because you're coming to me with that posture, I'm going to release you what you owe me. But when the man left the king, Jesus wasn't done telling the story. When the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant. This is another person, another servant like him, sort of more of a peer. He wasn't, the, the, he wasn't a superior to this guy. The guy just owed him some money. A fellow servant who owed him, and another Hebrew word, hekton denari. Hekton denari basically means a hundred denari. Your translation might say a hundred silver coins. But it's, the, the literal translation is a hundred denarii. We'll get back to the denominations in a second. And, and it, look at this. Instead of remembering what he just walked out of, I mean, he just walked out of being forgiven a debt. Jesus tells, he, he, says, he says, instead he grabbed him by the throat and he demanded instant payment. 
He's not going to give him more time. And the fellow servant, he fell down. Look at this. It, it's like act one, scene two. And scene two it parallels scene one. His fellow servant fell down before him and he begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will repay it, he pleaded. But the creditor, the servant number one who had been forgiven his debt, he wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. He had him put into prison where he couldn't work to pay off his debt. Now, here's the quick math. I, I want to go back for just a second because this is important. Here's what we know so far. Servant number one had 10,000 talents. He, he owed 10,000 talents. Servant number two, uh, he owed 100 denarii. So, so what does this mean? Here's, what, here's why this is important. Uh, a talent uh, is 6,000 denarii. So one of these, he, owes, he owed 10,000 talents. One of these equal, equals 6,000 of these. So you can see the, 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 the difference in, in what, what's owed. And... One of these, a denarii, equals a full day's wage. So one talent is 6,000 denarii. One denarii is a full day's wage. So just think about this. Servant number one owed 60 million days wages. 60 million days wages. And, and, and servant number two owed 100 days wages. 60 million versus 100. It, now, you're like, okay, what, is, what does that mean? Let, let's just bring this into today's terms for a minute. By federal law, minimum wage across the country and, and in the state of Georgia is $7.25. $7.25 is minimum wage. If you multiply that by an eight-hour day, let's just call that a full day's, a minimum full day's wage in, in our state currently is $58. It's a minimum full day's wage. You're going to work a full day, eight hours, minimum full day's wage, $58. If you calculate 60 million days wages, it's $3.48 billion is what was owed versus $5,800. This isn't, this isn't small versus big. This is significant. If somebody owes you $5,800, that's significant. It's significant versus irreconcilable, like immeasurable. You can't pay that off. And if you can, by the way, if you can pay that off in the room, by the way, today, I would love to introduce you to a thing called Be Rich because we would love for you to help us help lots of people. We won't keep any of it. We'd love for you to help other people. I just want you to think for a second. If you owe $3.48 billion, to me, this is where it's, it's hard. It's, this is Jesus telling a story. It's hyperbole. Everybody's going, I mean, that's insane. Like, who owes that much money? Which, that's my question. I got all sorts of questions for Jesus about his stories. First, who racks up that kind of debt, number one? And who keeps lending that guy money? I mean, that's ridiculous. Who's, who can, I mean, how do you just, you know, you know you're never going to get that paid back. But more unimaginable than that, more mind-bending, more mind-blowing than that, is the king's response to the servant. I mean, remember the servant asked this. He owes $3.48 billion, but the servant asked, please be patient with me and I'll pay it all. Both servants asked for this. Servant one, when he came, he wasn't saying reduce my debt. He wasn't saying forgive me my debt. He said, just be patient with me. Give me some more time. And notice what the king does not say. He doesn't say, okay, I'll give you a little more time. If you'll, if you'll lay out a payment schedule, you'll show me your income, You'll show me how you're going to pay it off over time, and you'll, you'll lay it out for me. I'll, I'll begin, I'll, I'll have some more patience with you. I won't have you sold. I won't have your family sold. I won't have everything you own sold. I, I, I'll, I'll be patient with you. The king actually denies the request for an extension. And instead, he cancels the debt. The king, because he can, he cancels the debt, which... To us makes no sense. And, and, and it causes the question to go, why? why? Why would he do that? And it's not because he promised to pay it back. It's not because the king thought he would have some time. He ain't never going to pay back 60 million days wages, right? Like, just think about it. Like, nobody thinks it can be paid back. In fact, when Jesus is telling the story, everybody listening is going, you know, you give you a little, be patient with you. You're not, you can't pay this back. Here's what the king knows. This guy's one and only hope. Not just his hope, his whole family's hope. His whole family's hope for not being sold into slavery was mercy. It was grace. It was canceling the debt. It was forgiving the debt. And because the king is merciful, 
That's exactly what servant number one gets. And he walks free. Remember what Jesus said. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. I know that doesn't make any sense in your economy. Because in, in business, and if you're, you're a creditor, you, this doesn't make any sense. You can't cancel a debt like that. Like, there's, there's no tax benefit enough, which didn't start till the 1400s anyway. There's no tax benefit enough to, to, to make that make sense. And as unimaginable as that, as that is, what's equally unimaginable, but for a totally different reason, is the fact that he walks free, and when he walks free, he walks out into somebody indebted to him. How amazing is that? Before we talk about what he does, he walks out and it's like the role reversal. He walks into somebody who owes him in the same way he just walked out of somebody who he owed that set him free. We, years ago, we, um, some of you, how many of you guys have played Uno before? You grew up, I, we grew up playing Uno. Okay, a bunch of played Uno. How many of you played Uno Flip? A lot less of you, but, but some of you. That's good. So Uno Flip, if you don't know what this is, it was sort of a... Honestly, I think the original Uno is better. The, the originals are always better than the, the sequels and all that type of stuff. But, but um, Uno Flip was sort of like a twist on the game. I think they needed to reinvent themselves. And Uno Flip, if you don't know this, there's actually two sides to the cards. And when you're playing the game, you can like have a good hand and like think like, okay, I got great cards. I'm going to get out quickly. Like, you know, I, I, can, I, can, I can win this game. And then all of a sudden, somebody plays the flip card and you have to flip to the other side. And your cards on the other side might be a disaster, like when you flip them over. And so the game's kind constantly changing. Well, one of the other cards in the game, I mean, there's several different things. I mean, you can, you can give like, and, you know, in, in the regular Uno, draw four is like the worst. I mean, this, I think you can get like one where you like draw 20. And like, there's all sorts of crazy things that happen in this game. And, um, and, it, and it's actually a, a lot of fun. They messed up the original game a little bit, but, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, one of the cards, which is awesome, is uh, a card, if you get this card, you can actually uh, trade cards with somebody else in the circle. So we're playing this game. We're all playing as a family. It's a few years ago. Was my youngest was about six. And my youngest, he got like the draw 20. And you, you oh, and the other thing is you can choose who you want to draw the cards. So he get, plays down the draw 20. And I'm, I'm close to winning the game. And I had won a few times. And truth be told, I'm pretty competitive. And I win a lot in our family. I, I told you I don't let my kids win anything, ever. It's, I don't think that's merciful. I don't think that's loving. I think that's lying to your kids, okay? So I don't let them win. So he drops the draw 20 card, and he's like, Dad, Dad's, good. Dad's taking the 20 card. So I pick up the cards, and everybody's laughing. We're having a lot of fun. And when I pick up the cards, one of the cards I get is the card to trade cards with somebody else. So great. Comes around to my turn. He's only got a few cards left. He's in the winning position. I'm just waiting. I get my cards, and I pull out the card. And I said, how the tables turn. And I set down the card. And he's like, what does that mean? I was like, this is the trade card. And, he, and he's like losing his mind. Like he thought he's winning and, you know, he's losing his mind. So I give him all the cards. And, and then next, the next in line, and I, I, I'm a little ashamed to say this, but my family has followed suit. And so I, one of my older kids heaped a bunch more cards on him to just, you know, have fun in the moment. So he's like, can't even, his little hands can't even hold all the cards he has at this point. And he's sitting over there, and as it's getting closer to his turn, I see this little smirk on his face. And he pulls out a card, and he said, how the turn tables. <laughs> how the turn tables. This is what's happened in the situation. This, the, the, there's a role reversal. And the servant walks out into somebody who owes him, and the servant, the fellow servant that owes him, he begs, not for mercy, not for him to forgive the debt, simply for more time. The same thing he was asking, will you just be patient with me? Will you give an extension? And he refuses and he throws him into prison where he can't work to pay off the debt. And, and this, is, this is important. What was owed is not insignificant. It, it, it's irreconcilable what, what the servant one was owed or, or what he owed. What he had to pay off was irreconcilable. This is not insignificant versus significant. This is, this is significant versus irreconcilable. Now, I, I want to take us back to Peter's original question, because if, if you remember the question, this is, this is so important to the point of the, the story. 
The, the question Peter asked in the beginning that prompted the whole story, the story that Jesus told about these two servants and the debts and all that stuff, he says this, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Which to you and I, it feels like he's pulling a number out of a hat. As I told you earlier, seven represented completion. Paul, or, or, uh, Peter probably thought, this is probably going to be Jesus' answer because that in our culture, that, that means completion. And also because Jewish rabbis at that time, they taught it was unnecessary to forgive more than three times, especially for the same offense. So if somebody offended you three times in the same way, you only had to forgive them three times. And then it was, it was on them. You didn't have to forgive them. You could punish them. You could, keep the, you could hold the debt over their head. You could make them pay for it. And, and they pulled that right out of Amos. Amos is, is a book in the Old Testament. In Amos chapter 1, Amos chapter 1, uh, the people uh, repeat the same offense three times against God, and then God punishes them. And so the rabbis would teach, hey, this is what God's like. Now remember, Jesus is telling this story so we will understand what God's like. And Jesus is, when he tells a story, it, it seems like Peter's willing to go above and beyond more than three times, because he thinks this is what Jesus is going to say. He's willing to forgive seven times, maybe because that's the number of completion. I don't know, but the truth is, Here's what Peter really wanted to know. And if we're honest, oftentimes for us, it's what we want to know. The question Peter's asking is, when can I be unforgiving? Like, how far is too far? When do I don't have to forgive anymore? Now, I want to, I want to fulfill my religious responsibilities. I want to be a good person. I want to be seen as a good person. But there's got to be a limit to that. There's a limit to how good I have to be, to how forgiving I have to be. And this is what makes Jesus so brilliant. This is why Jesus is such a brilliant teacher. Peter wants to know how much grace, how much forgiveness he's required to offer. He wants to know what's reasonable, Jesus. Show me where the line is. I'm willing to, I'm willing to work right up against the line, but show me where the line is where I don't. And my, my assumption is that Peter's been, he's been offended in a significant way. Somebody's hurt him. Somebody owes him. And Jesus responds by pointing out how much grace he's received. What he's received is an unreasonable amount. What he's been forgiven is an irreconcilable debt. Here's Jesus' point. If you don't understand that, you won't get forgiveness because our capacity to forgive flows from what we've been forgiven. You, you, the reservoir you're gonna draw from to forgive others, it comes from understanding what you've been forgiven. And so the question for you and for me is, how do you view the debt you've been forgiven? And is the view, is, is the debt you've been forgiven, do you see it correctly? Do you see it clearly? Jesus, the master storyteller, the master teacher, he's telling this story. And he's using hyperbole, but he wants Peter and he wants you and me to understand what we've been forgiven. Now, here, here's the thing. I want you to imagine that a bead, just a singular bead, these are those little beads that, that you know, you make bracelets and stuff out of. I want you to, 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 um, Imagine that this bead represents what Peter was owed, or maybe for some of you, what somebody's owed you. Now, I don't use this one bead to say it's insignificant. I'm not saying like, hey, this is all that, that's owed you. I'm just trying to help you understand, and I, I just, if you get mad at me, I didn't tell the story. I'm just reporting the news, okay? Jesus told the story. Here's, here's the ratio. I want you to understand the ratio between what Jesus is saying was owed by the the second servant versus the first servant. And, and, and this is significant because when we think about what people owe us, one of the hardest things about forgiving others is it seems so great because we don't have any context. It's all, it's all what somebody did to me and what they owe me and how they hurt me and how they've offended me. And, and we don't have any context for, for comparing that to something else. And that's what Jesus is doing. And this is what Jesus is saying is, the truth is, is when you understand the debt of what's been owed to you, there, there's a significant difference between what's owed you and what you owed. Between the, the, the debt that was paid for you, the, 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 the debt that was canceled for you, and the debt that someone else owes you. And, and look, I'm not making, I'm not saying it's insignificant. I'm just, I just want you to see the, the ratio. Jesus is trying to help us understand how significant and how vast God's forgiveness 
God's grace, his mercy is for you. And some of you think I'm done, but I'm not even close to done yet. Here's the thing. It, it's like the team made way too much work for me today. These things are heavy, actually. And we ran out of space, so we had to just top it off with one big last one that we put over here on the side. Here's the thing. I don't want you to miss this. This is so important. The debt that was owed in the story. If this represents what Peter, what Peter was owed, or what you and I are owed, because of what somebody did to offend us. What we've been forgiven in Jesus' story is 600,000 times greater. That's the ratio between 5,800 and 3.5 3 billion. It's 600,000 times. Now, here's the thing. I don't want you to get lost. I don't want you to get lost in this. Look, some of you, you may have been owed something like this. It may be, it may be greater. I don't know what it is. I think Jesus is saying, hey, on average, it, the truth is, is it, it, it's not insignificant, but it's not irreconcilable. It's, it's not like this. And, and here's the question you have to wrestle with, is which servant do you believe you are? I mean, are you the servant that, 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 owes, that owes this? Or are you the servant that owes this? And this is where we get lost in the story, is when we don't recognize who we are. See, the decision you have to make is, will you forgive just as you have been forgiven? Now, some of you, this is real talk. Some of you, like Peter, you've been hurt, you've been offended, you've been wronged by somebody, maybe by more than one somebody. And for some of you, the offense was significant. Maybe it involved abandonment, a painful betrayal, infidelity, or abuse. And what they owe you feels unforgivable. The suggestion of forgiveness, I'll just say this, for you, it, it, it feels insensitive. It may even feel offensive. Some of you are thinking, it's not that simple. And here's what you hear from me. You're right. Kind of. It's not simple. And it's not that simple. Here's the harsh truth about forgiveness. The reason forgiveness is so hard is because to forgive somebody else, you have to absorb You're deciding they no longer owe you. And in doing so, you're going to absorb the pain they caused you rather than making them pay for it. And nothing about that is simple. Think about it. Isn't it true? Some of you, you've been offended. Somebody's hurt you in a significant way. Isn't it true when it comes to significant offenses? There will never be enough for them to do. They'll never be able to do enough. They'll never be able to make it up. They'll never be able to pay you back. They'll never be able to restore what was lost. And isn't it true the only path forward in the relationship is canceling the debt? Now, this is important. You can't do this until you, you first considered or counted the cost of all of what you have to absorb. And you know this. Because when, when somebody's hurt you or even when somebody owes you something, you, you can't actually reconcile. You can't make the relationship right until you've talked about what actually happened and why it mattered and how it hurt. And, and, and both parties understand this. I've told you this before when my kids, I, I, I try this and I'll just tell you, I, every time I explain them, I have to re-explain, re-explain, explain. Because what happens is something happens between two of my kids. Somebody does something to somebody and then they, they do something back and then like that, eventually it comes to me and I'm some sort of how I have to be a referee dad. And so they're bringing it to me. And some of you, been in this position. They bring it to you and everybody's telling their story and you finally figure out somebody really did hurt somebody or wrong somebody else and somebody needs to apologize. And so, you know, we get to that point, we finally realize and, and one of my kids will say, sorry. And the other one will say, it's okay. And I'll be like, no, 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 no. It's not okay. You can't say that. And some of you today, it's tempted. You just want to dismiss it. You just want it to be over and you just want to go, it's okay. 
It doesn't work that way. It mattered. And you can't offer true forgiveness. I tell my kids, look, you need to talk about why did it hurt? What did they do? And then you need to ask for forgiveness. You, you need to count the cost. I mean, you need to, and, and this is true for some of you, you've been hurt in such a way that you need to talk to somebody and you need to understand the full weight of the cost that you're having to absorb. And you can't close your eyes to any part of the cost. I, I told you, it's not simple and it's not easy. You can't close your eyes to any part of the cost you're having to absorb. And if you do, you're incapable of actually canceling the entire debt. It's like telling somebody who owes you three and a half billion dollars, yeah, you can pay me $5,800. You, 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 because I'm gonna assume that's all you owe me. And it's not the case. And, and I'll just I, just, I just want you to hear me say this too. Look, if you're not ready, it's okay. It's okay to not be ready. You can't do this until you are ready. Trust me, you need to know the full weight of the cost before you can forgive. And forgiveness oftentimes happens in layers. I learned that from my therapist, just so you know. You, you have to forgive certain people in certain situations in layers. In the meantime, here's something I've learned. Progress is adding up the cost. I don't mean remunerating and dwelling on the pain and the hurt so that you can gain anger towards that person. I'm saying adding up the cost. How did it affect you physically? How did it affect you emotionally? How has it affected you relationally? What is all the cost and the pain you're having to absorb? And then asking God to help you have the capacity to absorb it. That's what this story's about. But you can't get stalled out there because there's significant personal consequences when we refuse to forgive. You have to keep making progress and understanding the total weight of the cost of what somebody did to you or maybe multiple people have done to you or what they didn't do for you. You have to count up that cost and you have to face it because there's incredible consequences for refusing to offer that forgiveness. In fact, when you hold back forgiveness, it leads to bitterness. And some of you know this, because there's a part of you, whenever you think of them, whenever you think of what happened, whenever you think of what they did with this, that other person, whenever you think of what they didn't get, do for you, what they didn't when they showed up with you, the bitterness starts to take root. And in actuality, this is a way in which we actually imprison or enslave ourselves. Eh. Even after being set free from our irreconcilable debt to, to forgive just as we've been forgiven, just hear me I'm, as your pastor, because I care about you. I mean, I care about your relationship and I care about the other person, but just hear this from me to you today. It's not just for your offender's sake. It's not just for the sake of the person who hurt you or betrayed you. The Apostle Paul said this, it was for freedom. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. What he did, what the king did when he sent his son to die on a cross to pay for you and for me, it was for our freedom's sake. You received grace and mercy and forgiveness for the sake of your freedom. So stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I mean, think about this. If you were the king, Let's just switch roles for a second. If you're the king, wouldn't you be furious if somebody not only imprisoned somebody else? That makes everybody mad. That seems crazy to everybody. Can you imagine if you forgave a debt and freed somebody only for them to imprison themselves after you absorbed the massive debt that you set them free from? Wouldn't that make you insane? I mean, you'd, I would lose my mind. That's why the New Testament instructs us this way. It says, look, make allowance for each other's faults. And you're like, no, no, this wasn't a fault. This was evil. This was brutal. This was mean. This was beyond that. This was intentional. This was so hurtful. It was a fault. They have faults just like you have faults. They failed just like you failed. It says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone. Not just the people that are easy to forgive. Not just the people you want to forgive. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. And so you must forgive others. Jesus would say, based on a story, the Lord forgave you an irreconcilable debt. 
so you must. Look, I, I, look, some of you are offended. You're like, no, it's more than that. Look, I don't care. I don't care if it's, if, if it's most of this jar. I, it doesn't matter. In comparison, what you've been forgiven dwarfs it. And the truth is, is Jesus' story, the ratio, the difference between the irreconcilable debt, it's significant. It's forgivable. Now, I, I feel like I need to stop for a second and just say, because some of you are arguing with me in your mind, there's a difference between reconcil reconciliation through forgiveness and enablement. I'm not suggesting you cancel a debt. Canceling a debt doesn't mean you just keep letting people borrow money. Like if somebody's been non-trustworthy and you forgive them, it doesn't mean you keep trusting them. I'm, I'm, there needs to be barriers. There, there, there needs to be boundaries for you. Like I, I get that. Relationships sometimes need to change. But I'm not talking about the relationship right now. I'm talking about you. Your spiritual, relational, and emotional health, you personally, it hinges on forgiveness. Both your ability to embrace forgiveness and your ability to extend it. Embracing forgiveness sets us free. Extending forgiveness keeps us free. One psychologist described holding back forgiveness as drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. Which is what we do when we hold back forgiveness. There's a bitterness that takes root in us. And we don't realize it's not hurting the other person. It's only hurting you. Here's what Jesus knew. He knew that bitterness and gratitude, they can't coexist. The point is not whether, or whether they can repay you or not. That's, that's not the point. The point is you were set free and refusing to forgive keeps you from living free. And if you can, Jesus is going, if you can focus, if you can understand what you've been forgiven, if you can get in touch with or get reacquainted with what you've been forgiven, all of a sudden it starts to break up some of the bitterness. It starts to get rid of some of the bitterness that causes you to go, I mean, okay, yeah, they offended me, they hurt me, but Jesus forgave me for all the things I've done in the past, for the things... I'm doing right now in my life that are not honoring to him. And for all the things I'm going to do in my future, he's offered me grace and forgiveness to pay for it all. Hear me. What they did matters. It hurt you. I've sat with lots of people as a pastor who are hurting. They owe you. Forgiving the debt feels costly, I know. But remember, your forgiveness cost the king's son his life. That's what he did to pay for what you owe. And he did it gladly. He did it willingly. He walked towards the cross. Let me ask you, is it possible is it possible you're holding back forgiveness because you've lost sight of what you yourself have been forgiven? Like last week, we all want to see ourselves as the older brother. There are no older brothers. There's only younger brothers posing as older brothers. In this story, we want to see ourselves as a second servant who's being wronged by somebody else, but we're all the first servant. If you didn't figure it out in the story, Jesus' point is your servant number one, and so am I. But God wants you to be free. The prison of bitterness, why he says to Peter, no, no, not seven times, 70 times seven. An indescribable, you need to do this an infinite amount because I want you to be free of the prison of bitterness. And a key step in that process is rediscovering gratitude for what you have been forgiven. This, these, these beads, these, these jars full of beads. Here's what you need to understand. This is the well. This is what you draw from. It's not, are they willing to be sorry enough? Like, do, do, can I take stuff out of here? If the fence is bigger, like, are they making up for it? Are they, are they doing better? Like, are they, are they paying me back? No, it's not that. It's even this one little bead. It feels like I'll never get rid of it. 
You won't. Unless you draw on the power of what God has forgiven you to begin to be able to absorb, to have the capacity to absorb the hurt and pain that needs to be forgiven. It can't happen any other way. Listen, if you're here today and you're not a Jesus follower, I'm so glad you came. Or if you're watching online and you don't consider yourself a Jesus follower, here's what I want you to know. I, I'm, I love that you're here. I, I'll just level with you. This is not just true theologically, it's true psychologically. Without the grace of somebody else, without an outside source, there's some hurt that can't be forgiven. The way I would say it is, without the grace of Jesus, without this sort of reservoir of grace and forgiveness in your life, some hurts and some offenses will be impossible to forgive. Humanly speaking, we just don't have a well deep enough to draw from to offer that kind of forgiveness to other people. The parable, the point of the parable is there's nothing we can do to reconcile the debt between us and the king. He chose to forgive it. Back to the earlier question I asked, who continues to lend this guy money? Who continues to let him rack up such a debt? But isn't that what we do? Come on. That's who we are. And I'll tell you who does it. Someone with unlimited resources to forgive and offer grace. And that king, your king, with the unlimited resources says, I will supply you with everything you need to offer the forgiveness that you need to offer to somebody else. That's the nature of God's grace. It is his well of grace by which we're all forgiven. And it's also his well of grace by which we all forgive. Okay, lastly, if you're following along in your Bible, you may have noticed I stopped short of the most disturbing part of this parable. And I'm gonna read it before we finish because I don't wanna skip anything. I don't like to skip. I mean, sometimes you go through and it's like, oh, I don't like that one, I'm gonna skip it. But I told you last week, Jesus told parables to disrupt and disturb. And oftentimes he just walked off. He was comfortable with making people uncomfortable. So how he concludes this parable is no exception to that. In fact, it's a great example. When some of the other servants saw this, they saw what servant number one did to servant number two. When they saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man and he had forgiven. And he said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. That's why I did it. You asked for mercy and I gave it to you. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? And then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And Jesus said this, that's what my heavenly father will do if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now, if that bothers you, it should. It bothers me. You should think about that. You should think about this. That's where Jesus finished the story and he walked off. He said, oh, we don't have time for me to tell you what I think that means today. You're gonna have to figure that out on your own, just like they did. Jesus walked off, that's where he ended the story and said, that's what we're gonna finish today. You should think about that. It should bother you because your heavenly father cares most about your heart. He wants you to be free. Forgiveness is key to that. Let me pray for you. God, thank you today for this truth. Thank you for this powerful and brilliant made up story. Thank you that what matters most to you is our heart. Pray for hearts all across this room and all across the internet, people listening way later to all this. Pray for somebody first today who needs to extend forgiveness, needs to extend grace and mercy, and they can't even imagine how that's ever gonna be possible. I pray you'd lead them back to the well of your grace. I pray that you'd open their eyes to the fact that they're more sinful and more broken than they could possibly imagine, but they are more loved, more cared for, and more provided for than they could possibly dream. They would understand the depth of your well 
of grace and mercy and forgiveness from them. And then I pray that they would draw on that to offer it to somebody else. God, I pray for somebody today who's never embraced that. That maybe today for the first time they would recognize that in all their faults and failures, you're not holding any of that against them. You, you want to cancel the whole debt. All they have to do is receive, to receive your forgiveness, to receive your grace and to receive your mercy of canceling that debt and forgiving it so there's nothing between you and them. I pray that there would be people, many people who decide today that they're gonna trust you in that. Choose not, not to pray a prayer, but to choose to place their faith, their trust in the fact that there's nothing between them and you because you chose to remove it if they would receive that free gift of grace. I pray many people would do that today for the first time in their own hearts and they'd share it with somebody else. God, give us the courage to know exactly what to do with what I've heard today. The clarity and then the willingness to do it so that we can continue to be people who are free to experience health and wholeness and we can begin to thrive in life and the life that you have for us, the life that you offer to us. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Powerful stuff, isn't it? Kind of heavy a little bit, and I just I just um, echo everything Joel just said. And the reality is that if you're here today and you're feeling stirred, like, man, maybe it's time for me to deal with this thing, I would urge you, yes, it's time. And if that is you, um, I encourage you to take that step, have that courage today. Before you forget about it, before it goes in the rearview mirror, have that courage today to get to that point of forgiveness. And um, if you need somebody to talk with about it, talk through it, pray with you about it, I'm here. My wife, Courtney, is here. Our church leaders are here. Um, don't hesitate to come stop by and, and just ask for somebody to walk through it with you. Uh, well, that said, I am so glad that you've been here today. Uh, I hope you all have a great rest of the week, and we're excited because uh, next week we'll be continuing in, um, in power of a made-up story. So come on back next week, invite a friend, and we'll continue in the series. Look forward to seeing you then. Have a great week.